Yeah, no, I never really, I think I, I played the banjo during my teens and I really only went back to the fiddle uh, in Irish traditional music when I was about sort of 18 or 19. Or, uh, so it was kind of a late starter in that respect and I never, it was never really an option as a career choice, I don't think. In fact, I remember the first time I played the fiddle on stage. It was, uh, I think it was in a, f a folk club in Cove or Cork and I decided I would chance this tune called The Woman of the House as the encore I was playing with the band from Donegal called Fair Day and afterwards three fiddle players came up and uh, suggested ways I could improve my playing of uh, The Woman of the House <laughs> so that was my first venture into fiddling on stage so I think it's, it's like a lot of people I sort of stumbled or fell into a career in journalism and that's basically what I spent most of my life doing and uh, then the fiddling was just a, was a kind of a sideline but I always had a I always had a big interest in the fiddle playing as well, and fiddlers. I'd gone to the Derry Journal back, uh, the hunger strikes only really were kicking off when I was working in Derry and uh, so all the funerals and the high tension and then the the troubles just was was a big part of it. It dominated everyday life basically. In fact if you look at this, um, I picked this picture here because I, I opened an exhibition it's, uh, with Living, Richard Livingston and um, I got that picture and I, I was interested in it because it kind of summed up the atmosphere in Derry after five o'clock in the evening. In other words, there was absolutely nobody on the street, much unless there was a riot happening or that. So the troubles dominated life, but life went on and we had good sessions and, you know, the best people and all that. Uh, but the troubles were there and uh, they continued right up into the 90s. So by the time I left, uh, I was living in Belfast at the time, I was ready for a move away from the troubles and having a pub in Killy Bays was, a, was an excellent uh, change, you know, a completely different atmosphere. I don't think you ever get immune to it all. I mean, there's some, there, there's some things that just, that I remember. Well, I was, I left the paper and then I started working in radio and then I was working in t uh, television on the BBC in Belfast. Um, so uh, I was, sometimes I'd be the reporter on call. So if anything happened, even during the night, you'd be sent out. So I remember I was uh, sent out to the, the work, the T-Man the bombing, for example. Uh, and I remember that. Uh, I arrived down and went into a shop to find out where it, where it had happened. Uh, the multiple deaths as a result of you know, the they blew up a workman's bus. And there happened to be a woman who was in uh, the shop at the time who was saying about arriving on the scene of the just the explosion after it happened. And it was like this. And she left the shop and I went out and I said, you know, would you mind talking to me on tape with the BBC in Belfast? and. Uh, so I put the, the recorder on top of the car and interviewed her beside the car and then she, <clears throat> we couldn't use a lot of the interview because it was too graphic. You know, she was, when you look back, actually she, she was in shock probably, but um, so I remember that and I remember being there all night and the, the sort of the ticking of the, gen or the sound of the generator as they were working, the, some of them, the lights were up where the explosion had happened. So that sort of thing. Then I remember the uh, Armour Road Bookies massacre I think I went to all the wake houses on the on the Monday morning, and uh, then I just to just to crown it off after speaking to all these grieving relatives, I then met the. Uh, I was at I went up to the boogie shop just to where the 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 gunmen had burst in and sort of sprayed the place with bullets and there were multiple deaths again, and uh, so I was talking to some young young fellas and he said you know his his brother was one of the people that, so I interviewed the brother then of the youngest uh, guy who died. So that means I'd sort of think of uh, interviews with six grieving families that morning. And uh, so that's, that's sort of, yeah, I think you never get immune to that sort of thing. 
I, I suppose it was it was good to have it there during COVID because it meant that we're still doing a bit of playing because I was still recording uh, stuff for it until relatively recently. So it's just out and there's a lot of, um, I mean, it's maybe it's for the aficionado. It's unaccompanied via uh, fiddle. There's quite a lot of Donegal stuff in it. There's unusual tunes and unusual versions and that. So, I mean, I'm not going to make any claims about the playing because there's so many brilliant players uh, around. Uh, but I just, in fact, I, I've just been thinking about uh, when I, I bought a book, uh, Oh, I'm Go Ham, from Tommy Peoples, you know, uh, and he signed it for me. And he says, uh, I hope you get something out of this. And I remember being struck by that. I hope you get something out of this. I mean, I'm going to get everything. I'm going to. That's brilliant to have it. But he was being really modest. He was kind of being modest about it, and just saying, "I hope that you get something uh, that that you value out of this." And I, I just hope that people just get something uh, of interest from the album. So this tune is kind of flavor of the month at the moment. Um, I've been playing it in different. It's called Arthur Darley's and uh, actually passed the house where Arthur, Arthur Darley, just on Sunday they were past the house where Arthur Darley used to live. It was a Brooklyn house in Brooklyn near Duncan Neely. Arthur Darley was a well-known, sort of played the violin, played the fiddle, and I've looked at papers and I've seen, you know, be looking at old paper for something, maybe researching something, and you see this thing, Arthur Darley will give a performance or give a talk on music, such and such place. So that he lived there, and this tune is a tune which was played by John Doherty, and he called it Arthur Darley's, and it's also known as uh, the Swedish Jig for some reason. And it's also, but I think the name is Brooklyn Shore, because that's where the house is. And it's paired with another tune called McSwain's Bay. So they're McSwain's Bay and Brooklyn Shore are the same body of water. So I'm just going to go back to the original key for this time. <laughs> everybody else we kind of missing a bit of uh, human contact there I was uh, I met a uh, couple of boys down in the teal in there we were chatting to them and you're thinking God uh, you know we chatted for a good while and you're thinking God it's, uh, it's great to get uh, you know t actually chatting to people you know again uh, so you those encounters that you that would have happened every day and you, you've been out socializing and Everybody's out and just having a chance of a bit of crack and a chat and a catch up hasn't been possible. And I suppose traditional musicians have been hit. You know, musicians have been hit badly because they, you know, if I think the people that I know that make their some of their living or maybe all their living from music, 
I've been fortunate I'm not really in that category so uh, my job has continued during COVID so that's been a big uh, bonus and uh, I suppose the social side uh, and as, as musicians I suppose we're kind of we've got a we've got the resource because we're used to playing being on our own practicing or listening to music that sort of thing so maybe we haven't been as badly hit as some people by, by COVID but at the same time part of the musical life has been out and playing along with other people particularly in Irish traditional music so we've definitely missed that and we're looking forward to that coming back. Well, I suppose COVID maybe has brought that into a bit of perspective and that um, you, uh, I would definitely say you know value value your time you know spend your you know do do things <laughs> you know and uh, learn things and because there's a there's a like for instance, uh, when we're out here at you know at night out in the countryside, because we were living in town before this, uh, you go out and you look at the the sky and you think, oh my god, I know absolutely, I know really very little about the sky. I mean, I know the plough, which I tend to look at every night. <laughs> you know, it's over the ho- it's over the house at the moment. But there was a guy from Remelton, Samuel Gamble Bain, and he left and became a multi multi millionaire in the oil business in the states back. He left at the end of the sort of nineteenth century, and he died around 1920, 21. His, I think, his, his first book was *The Night Sky*. He wrote a book about the sky, and I think maybe back in his day, before electric light and that sort of thing, people were much more focused on on uh, on night and what was happening, what changed. Um, but that's just for me as an example of all the things that are out there that are to learn about, and you only have a limited amount of time. So I would say make the most of everything, all the time you've got, and just sort of drink it all in. Well, you know, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> um, well, I just celebrated my 60th birthday there, so I hope I'm around to celebrate the 70th. Uh, and uh, no, I, I mean, I think, I suppose you do get a different perspective um, uh, when you when you sort of reach that. You know, you sort of. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I'm not. I'm actually not going to be here forever. The realization dawns, you know, you're not. Whereas when you're younger, your life sort of seems to stretch in front of you, and then, but you, now you start realizing that actually he's got a finite point. So that must be terrifying, though. <laughs> no, because I think um, you, you, you know, it's just a fact of life. And you, if if nobody ever die, like everybody would still be running around, there'd be no room for anybody. <laughs> So uh, no, so that's that's going to happen. So I just uh, I'm keen to do stuff. So I've just finished a masters and I looked at East Donegal fiddle playing. It was my chance to go back over some of the recordings that were made in the sessions when I was growing up. So I've pulled out recordings and put them up on the Donegal fiddle website of people like uh, George Peoples, Paddy Douglas, John Douglas, who's still playing away and has just a, a, got a CD out himself. Uh, the magpie's waistcoat keep an eye out for that so uh, I just continued doing that sort of thing and, and, and learning stuff I mean I was reading uh, briefly a discouraging article there a couple of days ago which said that the older you get the harder you find it to learn things and I actually don't think that's that's true and I, I would never I would I would encourage people to start learning even Adults. I was talking to a woman there, and she said, "You know, I was always useless, and they told me I'd never been any, any good. I should never." Be. I would say, no matter what age you are, you know, take up an instrument and learn. You can do it. Uh, my mother's friend, Mrs. Carr, took up the fiddle. I think she, I don't know what age she was. She was in her sixties, and I mean, she went to flies and played tunes. And I think that even you know, doesn't matter what age you are. There, there's stuff you can do. There's things you can learn, and there's places you can visit. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next few years. Um, just hope I get uh, get plenty of them. <laughs>